Okay, Senator Graham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having the hearing. This has been very informative, and I appreciate all of you. I uh, respect you greatly. Appreciate uh, the comments you've made and the advice you're giving. This is ultimately up to the Congress and the President's side what to do. General Amos, pound for pound, do you agree the Marine Corps is the, the best fighting force in the world? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> we celebrate that today on okay, our Okay, good. <laughs> I agree with you. Do you agree with me the only thing older than the Marine Corps when it comes to defending America is the citizen soldier? Sir, I believe that's true. Okay, so I'm here to tell everybody, I appreciate it, but the citizen soldier's time has come. You're going to get a seat at the table, General McKinley, if I have anything to say about it. We're long into this fight as a nation. The first shot was fired by the citizen soldier. It's time for the citizen soldier to be sitting at the table, not just for political reasons, but for substantive reasons. So let's talk a little bit about substance. Uh, General Dempsey, do you agree that one of the great threats America faces is not just attack from a foreign enemy, but from nature, natural disasters? Yes, Senator. Okay. When it comes to frontline service against national disasters and the havoc it can reap on the American people, do you agree the National Guard is the frontline force? Uh, generally, law enforcement, then National Guard, then active. When force. it comes to uniform personnel. Yes, I do. Okay. General McKinley, Hurricane Irene. Irene, is that right? Is that the name of the last big hurricane? That was our latest uh, event, yes, sir. Okay, tell me, who, who talked to you about Hurricane Irene? Uh, I was consulted by the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense, Paul Stockton, and, and that, that was the extent of my discussion. Did anybody from the uh, Chairman of the Joint Sheets call you and ask, hey, what's going on? No, um, incumbent upon me to pass that information up, but no, nobody made that call. Okay, so uh, did anybody from the White House call you? No, sir. All right. So if you believe that the nation is threatened by natural disasters and the frontline uniform force is the National Guard, I would like to have you sitting there, not by invitation, by the way. General Dempsey, you're a very fine man, but if you got pissed off at him, could you tell him to get out of the room? Yes, I could. Okay, good. Well, at the end of the day, I think you need to be in the room with some weight behind you, not just through invitation. Now let's talk about the structure of the state federal responsibility. Who talks more to the, judge, uh, the, the, the adjutant generals of each state, you or General McKinley, General Dempsey? Who has more contact? I don't have any contact with the adjutant okay. generals. Well, if you believe that the adjutant generals who have responsibilities over the National Guard, you don't have any contact with them, how much contact do you have, General McKinley? Daily. All right, if you can't tell them how to spend their money, you can at least tell the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, if you're in the room, what's going on. Don't you think it would be important institutionally beyond the life of you and General Dempsey to have somebody in that room advising the chairman of the Joint Chiefs exactly what's going on in the states? I think in a post-9-11 world, it's, it's, it's essential. I couldn't agree with you more. Now let's talk about the history of the Joint Chiefs, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, when it comes to supporting legislation that we now all agree is important. Uh, do you agree that the Marine Corps, being a voting member of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, hasn't given the Navy two votes? Do you agree with that, General Amos? It has not given the Navy. Well, that was the big concern, and uh, Senator Webb was your biggest advocate. That was a real fight back in 1978, that if you put the combat on, all hell's going to break loose, the Navy's going to run the world. Well, that didn't work. And I don't think the National Guard being in the room is going to change the world as we know it, only for the better. Now, Mr. Johnson, headlines are made at every hearing. Is the headline from this hearing, Obama administration opposes putting the National Guard Bureau Chief on the Joint Chiefs? Um, uh, Senator, you've, you've heard the uh, best military advice from well, I'm going to tell you what Vice President Biden said in 2008 when he spoke to the National Guard Conference in Baltimore. It's time for change. Change begins with giving the Guard a seat at the table. That table in the Pentagon where the Joint Chiefs sit. President Obama's campaign document, Blueprint for Change, page 55, if you want to read it. I haven't read it. I'll be the first one to admit to it. But this part I do like. Obama will restore the readiness of the National Guard and Reserves. 
He will permit them adequate time to train and rest between deployments, provide the National Guard with equipment they need for foreign and domestic emergencies. He will also give the Guard a seat at the table by making the Chief of the National Guard a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Has he changed his mind? Um, the, uh, not to my knowledge. Well, don't you think when he said that he thought long and hard about this and he came to conclude as a prospective commander in chief this would be a good idea? And you're not here to tell us he's wrong, are you? That the president and the vice president are above my pay grade. Well, I think they're wrong a lot, but I think they're right on this. Now, let's talk about Goldwater Nichols. How many of you believe it works? How many, who, who believes it doesn't work? Speak up. Nobody. All right. Let me give you a little history. There's an article that I've read called The Campaign for Goldwater Nichols by John T. Carell. And I'll read a brief excerpt. <clears throat> the bill was being prepared and had been written in final draft, and Senators uh, Nunn and Goldwater go to have a meeting with the Joint Chiefs. And uh, Admiral Crowell was the chairman, the new chairman. He supported it, but during that meeting, everyone else opposed and said in no uncertain language, the hot-tempered Goldwater took their criticism as an attack on his efforts to make improvements and roared, if you think you can bully Sam and me, you're mistaken. The next day, he got eight letters from the Pentagon talking about how bad of an idea this would be, and Senator Goldwater said, I will not be deflected are sidetracked in this effort, even if I get a letter a day from everyone in the Pentagon. And the only reason I mention that is that the institution resisted Goldwater Nichols, the institution resisted having the Commandant of the Marine Corps on the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and I think we should consider the time has come, given post 9-11 duties of the National Guard, to have a seat at the table. It doesn't change command authority doesn't turn the world upside down, but if any group ever deserved recognition now, it's the members of the National Guard, and their voice needs to be heard not through invitation, but by us saying you have a seat. 